The Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. Let me welcome all of us back to another Bible study. The Lord has indeed been good to all of us, and we therefore ought to give him thanks and praise for his goodness and his kindness to all of us. Indeed, he is a great and he is an awesome God. We are going to be going into a Bible study series um, featuring relationships, a biblical view, a biblical perspective. And we will look into relationships as it came to us from the Bible. We will pursue how man looks at deals with, treats with relationship. We will look at the basic friendships. We will look at marital relationships. We will look at our relationship with God as Christians. And we will see that there are some common areas when it comes to relationships that we ought to possess. We will see that there are some things that are fundamental, some things that are key if we are going to have successful, uh, great, overcoming, positive relationships. And it is something that has to be looked at in light of all the things that are happening, not only in the world, because, you know, the world is there, but then when we take ourselves and turn the spotlight within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, some of the very things that are happening Two relationships in the world have found their way within the church of the Lord. And yet the Bible speaks to this very important concept, the concept of relationship. And we will see that God himself is a God that favors relationship because he is the one that indeed established that. And if we are going to walk a certain way, if we are going to be in right relationship, if we are going to be having overcoming, positive, successful relationships, we will see from the word that there are some basic ground rules, some fundamentals, some foundational things that we just cannot do without no matter what. So it promises to be a study that will enlighten us and that will encourage us and also motivate us. Before we delve in, however, I would like to use this opportunity, brothers and sisters, to make reference to what has happened since we last met in church on Sunday. If you would realize all by now that the government of the land has imposed another set of measures to assist in curtailing the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And as a result, although for the last couple of months we have been enjoying coming into the house, even though it is by groups, but we were there. What has now happened is that the situation has reverted to what it was some months ago where only 10 persons are allowed to come into the assembly. And that being the case, we are going to go back to the template that we had where all the saints save the 10 uh, that will come out and that 10 will have in it, the preacher, the, the praise team, the media team, uh, the musicians, just the bare minimum so that we can have the service. But as was in the template the last time, we, were, we streamed right across and everyone stayed at home, participated, and indeed, under the circumstance, it was a great blessing. We are back at that point. Uh, while we are disappointed, we just have to understand that this is what it is. And in all things, I encourage the saints of the Most High God. In everything, 
give thanks. And so we are going to still lift him up, still glorify him, still thank him. Because at the end of the day, amen, we are a part of the church. And whatever comes, we have to face it, receive it, deal with it. And in all of that, still give glory to the great God that we serve. So just to let you know, just to remind us, and for those who didn't know, to let you know that comes this Sunday, we will not be in the tent. What will happen, however, is that Sunday school, as it has normally been, will continue. And Sunday school continues at 8 a.m. So we will not be changing the time. Uh, we have got acclimatized to it being 8 o'clock uh, until 9. And we wouldn't want to shift that, only to shift it again afterwards. So it was agreed that we will continue with Sunday school at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. As a result of that, we would not, even though it is going to be just one service, no, we would not bother to remove it from 9 o'clock, which is the time that we would have normally had our first service, and then put it to 10.30. You know, Sunday school being 8 to 9 still, we will keep it as is, and then the one service that we will have we will have it at 9 a.m. Uh, to about 10.30 thereabout. So we want to use this medium to ask all our saints to remember Sunday school begins 8 a.m., the same time that it has been for the last few months, and we continue with that. And then we will have not two, <coughs> I'm sorry, not two, but one service. And that service begins at 9 a.m., all right? So we ask all our saints, as many of us, in fact, I shouldn't even say that, we ask all our saints, church begins at 9. So we are going to make the adjustments so that we are in church at the time that church is keeping. We can always go back to look at different sections afterwards, but, oh, it would be great if the body gets together and we are all in church via the platform at 9 o'clock. And we really, really would appreciate that. Also, I wanted to use the opportunity. Uh, we, we did bless a few of our saints on Sunday because... I just knew that folks were having uh, some difficulties, and there are more. And just at the time when we wanted to assist because of what we know was happening, the thing has gotten even worse. And so the very thing that we were trying to assist with starting Sunday Pass, the situation has become now more dire, and it is now happening at a time when there is no service so that we can even take an offering to assist some of these folks. And more folks are going to be affected. So just as we had done uh, months ago when we were under this template, where only 10 people were there, we came up with the novel. It was suggested and we followed through with it. We came up with the novel idea that we could have a drive-by and you do drop your tithes and your offering. Ushers will be here. They will not be in church, but a few, and we will have that worked out, very few, but they will be on the outside so that even though you pass to drop your offering off, you will not be allowed to come in the tent because we want to be conforming to the established protocol. But we do encourage us to drive by, drop off your tithes and offering, and if you're going to do something in terms of assisting those that are being severely impacted by the COVID-19 in terms of their livelihood, then you can still make a note that this is particularly for that. And of course, we will know how to do it and what to do to get it to them. So indeed, you can drive by, walk by, swing by, 
fly by, but however, you will not be able to stay in the service. And we, we really regret that, but it is what it is. And so the Lord bless you and thank you for your understanding and thank you for just being you. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Now, we're going to go into the subject of relationship. And it is important that we understand that God is a God of relationships. He is a relational God. And we see that from a number of things that we're going to be looking at that shows us that indeed he fosters, he facilitates, he wants, he encourages relationships and relationships of all sorts. We were made as social beings and as a result of that, the need to interact, the need to socialize, the need to have friends, the need to have companion is in fact, <coughs> sorry, a part of our construct and we must understand that and the God that made us made us with this uh, desire and with the capacity to love and to want and to pursue relationships the big question that now will be asked is how is it that God made us in this way how is it that God made us for relationships? How is it that God instilled and planted and injected in our DNA the need for relationships? And yet, when we get into relationships, when we get involved in relationships, after a period of time, it's seemingly um, disintegrated, it pans out into chaos and a whole heap of negativities are associated with relationships. Why? Why did God do that? The question is asked. But did God really do that? And so we are going to explore so that we can come to an understanding as to what the whole thing is about and why we do have some of the issues and the, the, the challenges that arise, that come up into relationship. And we will see that indeed the very book, the manual, the guidebook, the Bible, does indeed have answers, does indeed give the foundation, does indeed show us how enter, to engage, and to maintain, and to build from step one to step two to the highest level. It is all in the book. I want to start the discussion, the study, brothers and sisters, uh, from an angle within the church itself. All of us knows how great and how powerful and how mighty the God of heaven is. All of us want to have an experience with the Almighty. We know that he is the creator. We know that he is the maker. We know that he is almighty, all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, everything we know about him. We know all of his attributes. When we read from Genesis all the way over to, to Revelation, we see a God that is great, that is powerful, that is sovereign, that is in total control. This is the one, this is the God that we all want to be in close relationship with. We want to be located in close proximity to. And we all say that we would do anything to have a close, a tight, a deep relationship with Almighty God. In fact, a relationship with God consistent would be the ultimate in terms of relationship. And so we would have 
from the time that we were unsaved or if we listen to folks who are unsaved, some people say, I don't want to come to church yet because I want when I come, my mind is so made up that I give my all to God because he is not someone to joke around with. He is someone that you're going to give your whole heart and your whole mind and your whole soul to. And so is the saying. And so just the thought of relationship with God blows our minds simply because of who he is and what it means to embrace him and for him to embrace us. And so I want to take us back to the beginning of the early church. And I want us to look at the excitement and I want us to feel the, the pulse of the people at that time because something massive had just happened. Jesus was crucified, but he had now been resurrected. And the very things that he told them was going to happen seemingly start to come together and was coming to pass. And there was excitement. There was anticipation. There was great expectation. The church that he spoke about when he spoke to the disciples sometime before, upon this rock, upon Peter's confession, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The time was now upon them. The church was about to come on the scene. Things were coming together and the whole thing was about to happen. It was about to be unfolded right in front of their very eyes. And so the Bible tells us in the book of Acts, Acts is the history of what happened in the church uh, right through. And so the book of Acts, right at the first chapter, we start to read where Luke the writer declared, the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. <coughs> Sorry. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. I jump over to verse 14. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Great anticipation, great excitement. Everybody together, they were now following exactly what Jesus told them to tarry ye until in the upper room until you be endued with power from on high and they were doing just that and so we go we go over to chapter 2 now and verse 1 says and when the day of pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so the excitement continued, and we jump to verse 41, and it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And verse 47, praising God 
and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Brothers and sisters, I want us to feel the excitement. I want us to feel the passion of the people, those that were now baptized into the body, those that were now a part of the church, the very thing that Jesus spoke about was now here, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. So imagine that radiating, pulsating experience where they had the Holy Ghost, where they were now a part of the church. The question would have been asked, are you in the church triumphant? Are you in the Savior's bride? And they could easily at that time now answer, yes, I'm in the church. Yes, I am in the bride. Yes, I am a part of the body. And there was great excitement. As we read through the book of Acts, we see how the disciples or the apostles went from place to place. And men that were sick got their healing Folks that fell down as dead were raised to life again. Those that were blind or dumb or whatever the nature of the ailment. They had their sight or their speech or whatever it was. They had it all restored. And it was a time of great power and demonstration as it relates to things happening in the church. Those that came in were together. They were united. They had all things common. They called upon the name of the Lord. They esteemed everybody at the same level. And it was a time of great and mighty things happening in the church. The church was now born. And what a birth. What a mighty display of the power of God. And men were close to him. As they came and hands were laid on them for those who had uh, the apostles laying hands, they received the Holy Ghost. Cornelius and his house, they received the Holy Ghost. Where they, wherever they went and folks wanted the Lord, they received the Holy Ghost. They were baptized in the name of the Lord. It was just fire and it was just relationship and it was man and God having tremendous experiences. Those that were in the church, they took this thing serious. Those that played around in the church as Ananias and Sapphira had done and didn't understand relationship and didn't understand that when it comes to relationship with God, we have to take it serious. He expects the best of us and we expect the best from him. And so the Bible tells us that the experience with Ananias and Sapphira, they had relationship with God and they messed around with the relationship and it cost them their life. That is how serious God takes relationship and especially relationship in the church of the living God. And so this was the state, the passion, the drive, the burning desire, the red hot experience with God and man folks gravitated to the church but something happened after a number of years something that I want us to understand carefully because it is at the heart of relationship whether it is relationship man with God or it is relationship man with man there are some things that we must be very careful of because us not being aware and us leaving some things as many of us have done over and over and over the years we realize and we see that it damages relationship even relationship with almighty God so I use this as a starting point so that we can understand that if we don't do some of the fundamentals, some of the foundational things, even the most red hot, even the most tight relationship, not just with men now, but even with Almighty God, it can go south. It can go down. It can degenerate. Why do you say that, Brother Daly? The Bible tells us that from 
the time of the church here that we are reading in the book of Acts until a few decades down the road the apostle John got up and started to write as the Lord revealed to him things that were to come and he wrote the book of Revelation which is the revelation of Jesus Christ and he coined some things in that book that caused us to wonder how could this thing be a few years ago members of the church was red hot in their relationship with Almighty God and just a few years later Apostle John was writing now the book of Revelation and in Revelation chapter 2 I want us to listen to what it says in verse 4 nevertheless and he's talking to a church and this is Jesus talking this is not John having an issue with some folks because he perceived that they have fallen down in terms of their relationship with God this is Jesus Christ himself upbraiding the church because something had gone wrong whereas a few years before they were on fire and they were they, they were just pursuing and they were lifting up the name of Jesus and they had their desire in terms of relationship with God airtight a few years later Jesus called upon one particular church with its members and he said nevertheless I have somewhat against you they had a few things right but then they had a few things wrong and the things that they had wrong were some foundational things and it caused the relationship to suffer and if we can have that happening in our relationship with the most high the creator of the ends of the earth then what is going to happen when the relationship is between near mortal men and so here the word that Jesus used as a rebuke so to speak to the church at the time and they were doing other things good you see sometimes in relationship we pat ourselves and say oh I have done this and I have done that and he ought to feel good or she ought to feel good because I did this but we have not looked deep enough and we have not learned enough and we have not drilled into the word enough to know that doing a few things and leaving out others is still enough to cause deterioration and ultimately disintegration of any relationship whether just mere friends best friends husband and wife those that are not even married and are lovers or your relationship with God if some basic things are left unattended it is going to result in the collapse of relationships and the Bible teaches us that even from the book of Genesis as we go on we are going to take it from the beginning but I start here because I want us to see that even with our relationship with God which is supposed to be number one el numero uno even with that if we leave things unattended it will falter it will fail and we must recognize that nevertheless I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 Jesus speaking to the church how is that pos possible they have left their first love the burning desire that they once had they no longer had it the things that they would have done for the Lord they no longer did it at one point even in scriptures saints would have plucked out their eyes if called upon to give to a mere mortal man 
the, one of their leaders, the apostolic leaders, they would have done anything because of the love and the relationship and how close and tight and knitted it was. And whenever there is a good, productive, personal, deep relationship, we find that we tend to want to do anything for the person that we are in relationship with. And this is how and why the apostles themselves gave their very life because they maintained the relationship down to the very end and not even life itself was sweet enough that would have caused them to deny the God of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, with whom they had relationship. And that was something that was powerful and was extremely important that we catch that they died. Paul was killed in a gruesome manner. I believe he might have been beheaded. The apostle Peter was crucified on a cross like Jesus, except that he was turned upside down. The, the apostle James, he was killed while the others were alive, and it is said that he was flayed. They held him and put hooks in his skin and peeled his skin off. Like how you peel the skin off of a mango. Thomas was over in India. I don't remember exactly what happened to him. But they all died gruesome deaths. Because of the tight relationship that they maintain with Almighty God. The relationship that they maintain with the Lord Jesus Christ. They maintain the fire. They maintain the pureness. They maintain the intimacy, and when that is there, absolutely nothing comes between that kind of relationship. And not even life itself, and how sweet life is, will cause deterioration, breakdown, and disintegration of that kind of relationship. The love between the apostles and the Lord was maintained and it was passionate and it was pure and it was deep and it was real and it was strong. It shows that relationships can work. But we're going to have to do some things to make it work. And we will get into that. But the scripture that we just read, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. It means that while others may maintain theirs and it lasts and it is passionate and powerful and pure and strong and ongoing, then there are others who would have left their first love. And hear what Jesus said in the following verse, in verse 5. Remember therefore... From whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works. Repent, and do thy first works. So that what he was saying right here, that first work, those foundational things, those initial things that got us together and established the relationship to the point where it was red hot, those first things, it is easy for us to take certain things for granted when we have been around for a little while. It is easy for us to take certain people for granted when we have been with them for a little while. And that was exactly what stepped in where the members of this early church, though they loved him, though they worked, though they still did things for him, though they still were a part of the church, the fact is they were doing the things and going through the motion, but their hearts were not there. And Jesus said, I have a problem with that because relationships that are like that can never be maintained. And he said, do the first works. Get back to the things that you started doing at the beginning that caused the thing to be hot, that caused the thing to be on fire. 
And if we do that, and when we do that, there will be a getting together again and a rebuilding and a reconstituting of the relationship. So we see that even with our relationship with God, it can break down. It means that nothing happens merely by having things and autopilot. It does not happen with God, and it worse will not happen with men. Many folks are very concerned today, folks in the church, about relationships. There are things that were foreign to us within the body of Christ. And I'm talking right across the spectrum of the church. There were things that were foreign to us. But as the time draws nearer, and as the coming of the Lord draws nigh, we start to see a whole lot of things happening in the horizontal relationship. And when I say horizontal, I mean the relationship between men. And a lot of things are happening in our vertical relationship, the relationship with us and God. If we don't have a solid, strong vibrant relationship with God, I submit to you, brothers and sisters, we will not have a good relationship with our fellow men. If you are a husband or a wife, if you are courting to be married, if you are just friends like David and Jonathan, if you are going to have a good relationship, men with men, amongst our human brothers and sisters, we must have a strong relationship with God. Otherwise, it will not work. And I'm going to prove it from scriptures because we are going to use not what the popular culture uses, not what the world system uses to define what is a good relationship. What has been happening is that lots of questions are being asked, even within church circles. Why is it that this happened? Why is it that that happened? Why is it that uh, a man and a woman can't keep it together and get it together and have it going through? And genuine questions. Legitimate questions, and these are questions that demand answers. But the answers are right there, and I've often said it, and it might seem like an, a little cliche, something that we just say because we are Christians. The answer for all of our dilemma is in the book. It is in the book. A cursory reading will not be enough for us to pick out and to see concepts, and to see principles, we must all and all of us have the capacity to be students of the word and hear a little, veer a little, and put them together and make the thing happen. We spoke in Bible study recently about the Ezra principle in getting into the word. And we read of that in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. And that principle in essence, when the Jews were back in their land after they had completed their captivity in Babylon, they were, went back to the land of Judah and they were back in Jerusalem. And Ezra came and he decided that he was going to get into the word with them. Because remember now, they were in Babylon for 70 long years. And in that time, those folks had children, and those children had their children, and their children had their children. And so a set of folks were growing up that were not attuned to the word, attuned to the commandments, attuned to the things that were written in the books of the law. And so on their return to Jerusalem, Ezra decided that he was going to read the word to them. And he outlined three principles. Um, 
are, are three pointers that made up a little principle. They read the word consistently and they read the word seriously. So they seriously read the word and they consistently read the, read the word. And then after they read the word, then they were able to give context to the word. And then after they gave context to the word, Ezra now explained what everything is. So there is the serious, deliberate reading of the word. Then secondly, there is putting everything in context so that we can understand the background. And thirdly, Ezra moved to give the explanation, the meaning of the word. And we want to follow that principle as we go through this subject of relationship so that we can be clear in our minds that this book outlines some basic and some fundamental things. And in the very book, right from Genesis, there are principles that are there that we often neglect and we often go around, circumvent to our own demise. And yet the information is in the book for all of us to benefit from. And so the questions are asked, can relationship really work? My answer is yes. Then why is it that there are so much heartache and bitterness and bad experience in I, I hear it ever so often. If I travel, uh, once I'm over there, if it's in church circles or if we're just having dinner with, you know, visitors and so forth, many times the argument comes up about relationship and folks just have things negative to say about relationships. And we can possibly see why many times the negative vibration come about simply because of the experiences that many have had, the things that many have seen, and we do understand. But the Bible does in fact speak about relationships. The Bible does in fact give clear prescriptions as to how to properly, how to meaningfully get into relationship. I want us to be very clear in our minds that God wants us to have successful relationships. That this was his intention from the beginning. This was his plan from the outset. He wants us. He wants you. He wants me to have meaningful relationships. And we must understand and appreciate that. And that is a fact. And so we are going to look into the book. And it is important for us to look into the book. If we don't start with the book and follow the principle, we are going to always be in trouble. You know, this book, the Bible, the Word, it always will stand. It, is, it was Isaiah in chapter 40 that wrote something about this book where he says that the grass will wither and the flower will fade. But the word of the Lord will stand forever. And it is important that we understand that so that the concepts that we are going to be looking at with the, 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 the things that we are going to examine coming out of this book, we are going to look at the model that it provides and we are going to see if we are stacking up against what is in the word. And I'm taking it straight from Bible in this first week and possibly and the second week so that we see that there are foundational things. If we miss this, remember that our relationships, and when I say miss it, I'm not talking about missing this Bible study. I'm talking about missing the principle that have been established from the time that relationship was set up. It is important. 
that we see and that we grasp and that we take seriously the things that are written in the book. And so I would want us quickly to turn to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. And I'd love us to read from about verse... Let us start at verse 7. Genesis chapter 2. Um, we're going to bring it up on the screen for you. And we're going to read a few verses. And then I'm going to extract some things from that. I'm going to extract some things from that so that we are clear in our minds. We are clear, very clear in our minds. And the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Verse 8. And the Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from then it was parted and became into four heads. Now while you reflect on that scripture, I would like us to understand that we are taking relationships right from the book of Genesis. It is important that we recognize that God made everything and it was good. I want us to pick up three points that I am going to make as we go down. One, I want us to see right here in Genesis that God was trying to achieve three things. When he made man and he put him in the garden and all of these things, God was trying to achieve three things when he came to man and onward. One, he wanted man to reflect him. Two, he wanted to have a relationship with man. And three, God wanted man to freely choose to serve him. Yes? And it is important that we understand that. And I want us to notice that in as much as God spoke the world into existence and flung the stars across the galaxies and put everything in motion and everything was moving in synchronism and everything was just perfect, so to speak, because God saw everything and everything was good and it was just flowing and it was all together and things were just going perfectly the way that God wanted it to go. And yes, the animals came, the birds, the fishes, everything. God, however, did not breathe into them. Yes, he had relationship with them, but in a different way. But he did not breathe his breath into them. But I want us to notice, however, in the scripture that we read, that we started out, that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul so that the very essence of God was now inside of man. Therefore, man was now able to reflect God because the Bible said he was made in the image of God and God wanted man to literally uh, reflect him. Why so? Many of us do not recognize 
But I want us to learn this. In the celestial sphere, up in the heavenlies, God Almighty rules supreme. Just as he rules everywhere else, but because he dwells in that celestial realm, the angels bow before him. Everything is done in a systematic and orderly fashion. God exhibits and declares and shows his authority in the heavenlies. Angels have different tasks. Some are messengers. Some are warriors. Some, where are the cherubims and the seraphims? They do nothing more than just bow before him and cry, holy, holy, holy. Everyone works in their synchronism in their order of synchronism. Everyone do what it is that they must do. God has total authority. He is sovereign and he dominates everything that happens in the realm of the heaven. And so what God did when he created this heaven and earth and then placed man here he gave Adam the authority to have dominion. Adam took that authority because it was literally injected into his DNA because God made him in the image of God. And God basically was in charge. He had dominion over every realm. And his will, his will had to be done. And it was done to and so when God now came and established the earth and the heavens as we have them here and placed man here, man was the crown of his creation. Everything else he spoke, but when it came to man, and follow me now because I'm going slowly, because I want us to see that his relationship in terms of the deep-seated relationship was with man. And he now set the and the earth and when he made the earth and set everything up and put the animal kingdom into place and have the plant kingdom in place and the seed creatures and everything and all those things were made first then Adam came and Adam was not spoken into existence Adam was fashioned and shaped and molded it was like an artistic work being done. Not that he didn't care about the others when he spoke. Because they were, according to God, it was good. Even though he spoke them into being. But it was an artwork. Man was and then when he was through with that artwork, he breathed into him. And man started to live. Man became living. And so it is for this reason now, God gave him dominion. Every animal, everything that Adam named, so was the name. It was accepted by Almighty God. That was the name of it. He had dominion. Lions were subject to the man. Great whales were subject to the man. All the animal kingdom was subject to the man. He named them. So God placed him here to reflect his glory so that we see how precious a place Adam had in the sight of God. He was relationship with the man. Notice that as soon as God blew the breath of life into Adam, he then set up the garden. And he took Adam and placed him in the garden. That's very significant. In the garden was where God would come at a certain point in the cool of the day, whenever that was, and would fellowship with Adam. 
So he wanted to have the fellowship. And so he, he made him, but he already had made the herbs and the trees and those things and already for Adam. And then he so there were some provisions that were made by God for man. And then after he took man and he would then visit him there. And that is the relationship between God and man. Blossom, follow the progression. So God made everything, all the great things, and he just put them into existence. They weren't good. Came to man. His coming into being was different. More thought, more action, more formation, and then the breath from God to the extent that he was made in the image. God put some things in place for him and then placed him in the garden. And fellowship with him. So he was first made to reflect God's glory, and then God put him at a place where he could fellowship with him. Notice, brothers and sisters, that all of this happened before God said, It is not good for man to be alone. God first had a relationship with him. Sequence. Adam, the garden. In the garden, relationship. Notice that relationship with God. Adam and God was there in relationship before God said to him, it is not good for man to be alone. He established a relationship with man. And he came in the cool of the day and whatever he had to do, the relationship was with Adam. Adam was there naming the animals, doing what he was doing, relating to God. And all of this happened before God told him that it was not good. No, the first time that we have ever heard in all of this creation setting that it was not good was here. Because all the other things that he did, as we read through the scriptures and coming down in Genesis, it was good. When he did this on the first day and he did the other things coming down the line, they were good. And what is the only thing that we see in all of this that God said wasn't good? It was not good for man to be alone. Brothers and sisters, relationship came and was established by Almighty God. And he was the one that brought it together like this because he said it was not good to not be in relationship. We were made to socialize, to interact, to communicate, to share. And therefore, it couldn't have been good for the man not to be in relationship and fellowship. only spoke those words after he first had relationship with Adam. If we change the order, brothers and sisters, we are going to be in trouble. There is a part of us as human beings that only God alone can fill. If we don't, as individuals, establish a relationship with God first to fill that place, we are going to go into relationship believing that our relationship with a man 
or a woman can fill that particular void or cavity. It cannot. There is a place in all of us, brothers and sisters, that only God can fill. And if we are going to have, and I'm talking to people who are godly people now, people who are saved, because when God carried out this work with Adam, when he said it was not good to be alone and he was going to bring forth Eve, sin was not yet in the world. It was a pure environment. And God considered Adam his son when we were in us. And he was just going through some genius. And I wanted to make the point that Adam was in fact a son, the son of God. And here it is coming out in St. Luke chapter 3 and verse 38, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. So it literally shows his genealogy. And Adam was the son of God before even the lady Eve came into being and came into his life before him before he was God and it is the principle we must first as godly people remember I said sin wasn't in the world yet so these this was a godly man and you and I as Christians in this godly state if we are going to enter into relationship and engage in relationship it is important that we see the principle here that before a relationship sideways, a man and a woman, any relationship sideways, horizontally, we must first have a relationship with God. Many saints have rushed into marriage or have gone into marriage even if they didn't rush and don't understand the basic principle that we must first be Christians, we are first called to be saints. Before you're a husband, before you're a wife, before you're anything, you are first a Christian. I am first a Christian. Our first calling is to be saints. So as a Christian, we then must first ensure that our relationship with God is strong, is solid, is deep, and is burning. Many folks get hurt having gone to establish a relationship with some other person before they establish the right relationship with God. If we do that, we are setting up ourselves for a bitter experience. We must get the thing in proper sequence and we must see the order. So Adam and God set the thing, God set the garden, and in that garden, the relationship flourish. The relationship with God must be first. If we miss that model, we are gearing up for problems. Some folks, having missed it, they go ahead and then anticipate that the husband that they get or that the wife that they get is going to cover and take care of the innermost feelings and desires that they have but there are some things brothers and sisters that a husband or a wife will never ever be able to fill if we where it must be with God first and then with we are going to be in very very serious trouble then notice the relationship with God is established in the garden and in that garden we read the scripture earlier on he gave he, a lot of trees were there and he said of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil don't eat of that tree now imagine scores of trees I can just imagine a garden like that, Eden, many trees. Out of all the trees that are there, one, don't eat of that one. You know, you know what God was doing? Putting in place some limits, parameters. 
both. Even though God had a relationship with the man, God still had established boundaries. They represent our standards. In relationship, God wanted to have it with him first, and he wanted to be governed by parameters, certain standards. If we go outside of this basic model, it's right here in Genesis. I, do, I want us to see it, and I want us to just follow the sequence. So he was not yet joined to Eve, but he had a relationship with God. Sin wasn't even in the world, but parameters were set. Standards were established. Do all of this, but don't do this. It's not that God was making it difficult for Adam. God knows why he had that there. But God also knew that he wanted man who was now reflecting the glory of God, who was now reflecting the image of God. He wanted this man that he was now having relationship with. He wanted this man not to be in the relationship because God said you must be in the relationship. He wanted the man to choose to be in the relationship man the choice so he gave him a, gave him a multiplicity of trees but then he said one so God made it good for him here is a standard don't eat from this one and you notice what happened Adam didn't eat from it he had fellowship with God he did his work in terms of naming the animals and all the other things that he was doing and everything was well because the order was established. The model was followed. But note, however, it was already here. And I want us to, to look at this. And these are very serious things. Satan was already here. He did not tempt Adam. For whatever reason, he knew that something Big had just happened. He knew something massive had just happened where God made man and blew into him and this man had dominion. Remember now, you know, Satan was kicked out of heaven, thrown out. He had rebelled already. So he was not already in this realm. Remember when Eve came in and both Adam and Eve was here, Satan just turned up. So he was here. But even though he was there, have you ever wondered why he didn't Tempt Adam, even though Adam was there before Eve came and working and everything. He didn't tempt Adam. But notice, as soon as Eve came and they were joined in marriage, Satan turned up. This has nothing to do with Eve, if that is where you think I'm going. This has nothing to do with the lady. Where I'm going. While the man was alone, and he had an idea what was happening, he didn't do anything. But as soon as, or not long after, they came together, and there were no husband and wife, notice, it is the family that he was now attacking because he saw what was going to happen. They were going to produce after their kind. They were now in the image of God and they had fellowship with God and then they were going to be more to come and to come and to come and you were going to have an entire world of people that were worshippers of God. And so before the union, before the relationship, it was fine, but as the relationship came together, the attacks came. Not insignificant, brothers and sisters. And I want you to understand that in the same way that the adversary attacked the union of Adam and Eve 
from the time that they got together, shortly thereafter, the attack started. You getting together in relationship now, do not believe that from the moment you say, I do, there is not going to be a tax on you. Initiated and orchestrated by the adversary. It is going to come. And all of us that are married would have seen that it is so. However, if the model is as had been established in our lives and we had our relationship with God first and foremost and have it strong, and then no, we know the parameters that we are abiding in the standards as outlined in the book. Then we are in a position to take on the devil frontally who is seeking to destroy you because what he knows can come as a result of your union. Many folks don't realize that it is not their wives or their husbands that are at fault or are the issues most of the time. Yes, you know, we're going to have to deal with those. And Mark, you, I'm coming. I just want to establish a certain spiritual background. I want to establish a certain principle and model that was there right from Genesis so that we can see the progression. I want us to see that our married relationship is not just something that a man love a woman and a woman just head over heels in love with a man. If we ever get married because of we see somebody and the person look nice and that is all that there is and we get married, man, we have a problem. If you are a man and you know that you're not connected to God at the place where you should be and you see a beautiful lady and you are doing her her a great disservice and young lady if you just see a man and because he's handsome and nice and you see that he is not spiritual and you see that he is not at a place where god is his number one you see him not involved you see him just nothing to it but him just look handsome and he approaches you and you just say yes it means that something is going to happen not far down the line there are some things that must be in place the sequences god and man in relationship first appreciate understand and accept the parameters the standards the boundaries then you get together afterwards in relationship if you switch the order we will be in trouble and a lot of relationships are in trouble because we fail to see the established principle, model, and it is there. Now, many folks, we don't even recognize that when we are getting together in marriage, we are fulfilling what then would have been a future event, which is the establishment of the church. Before Eve came, remember, God made Adam from the dust of the earth. Eve came from Adam's side. And I was going through last night and I was trying to put some things together. The Bible tells us that the tabernacle in the Old Testament was a shadow, a type. It typified some things. And first of all, what God gave Moses on the mountain was something reflecting what was taking place in heaven. Follow me very closely. Because these are serious things, very spiritual things, very deep things, and they're all connected. So God called Moses up into the mountain, and he started to show him things and gave him instructions as it related to the tabernacle that he was to build in the wilderness. Yes? And as he showed him and gave him the dimensions, We saw, we see where it was a reflection of things in heaven. The mercy seat, the cherubims with their wings above the mercy seat. It was almost a replica of what was happening in heaven. 
that sat on this and the cherubims or seraphims would have their wings right over the throne covering their faces. We saw a glimpse of it in the book of Isaiah. These are things that were happening in heaven. And so what God gave Moses was typifying what was taking place in heaven. And God has to be very careful. that I gave you. But then having done that now, it continued because the tabernacle in the wilderness literally reflected what was going to happen later on when the church was going to be formed. And before the church was formed, it literally showed you that Jesus was going to be the lamb that take the sin of the world away. It literally showed you that Jesus going to be the very high priest of for the lamb. It showed you that the blood that he shed was the same blood that the lamb are typified. It was typified by the blood that the lamb shed back there in the tabernacle. They all had things speaking to things that were to come. They are all linked. Very spiritual. And I want us to note that when God was going to make Eve. The Bible said he caused that deep sleep to come over Adam. And Adam was in that deep sleep. And God opened his side and took out a rib. And around that rib he made a woman. And then God closed up back the flesh. And that woman became his bride. And God literally used the words. Um, and I, I want us, it was very, very, we, in the wee hours of the night, I looked at the exact wording. And it was very, very shocking. I mean, I've heard it before, but I took the time last night and I, I looked at it. And here is what it says in Genesis chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found any help me for him. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man and Adam said this is now bone of my bones and flesh flesh she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man First part again, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. And then he took her and she became his bride. She became his wife. So a deep sleep. Arise out of that deep sleep. God opened the side. God made a woman and presented that woman as his bride. And he used the words that show marital relationship. Bones of my bones. And flesh of my flesh. Now let's turn to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. Because it's very significant. Verses 29 to 32. And I want to show us how easily we can relate these two things. And, and that's the reason why I made the point. I want us to see the spiritual implications. I want us to see that this is a spiritual thing. So do you have scriptures 
are on the screen, which is Ephesians chapter number 5, verses 29 to 32. For no man ever yet ate his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it, it even as the Lord the church. Yes, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You remember we just read, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, in the book of Genesis. Now we are reading in Ephesians about the church. And we are seeing where it is saying the same thing of his flesh and of his bones. What is happening? The working that took place in Genesis, where Adam was in a deep sleep, then his side was open, and something came from his side, and from that, God made the woman and presented at his, as his bride. And then the pronouncement, bone, flesh of my flesh. Look what happened where the church is concerned. Jesus Christ, the second Adam, went into a deep sleep of death. While he was on the cross, gearing up to die, and to die, they thrust a sword in his side. And from there came blood. It was that blood that formed the basis of the church of Jesus Christ, which is none other than the bride of Christ. The church that you are and I are a part of is the bride of Christ. And this was formed as a result of his deep sleep in death and then the opening up of his side and here Paul is now saying that we are body of his flesh and of his bones remember Genesis bone of my bone flesh of my flesh very same words here flesh and his bones and both of them are speaking about the same thing the bride being formed and presented to the husband. In this case, Jesus is the bride. In the first Adam, Adam himself would have been the groom. And we see a connection. And verse 31, the, 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 the last verse here says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. And they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. I wonder, brothers and sisters, if we can see a linkage here. Adam, the deep sleep, something from his side, the bride formed. The second Adam, Jesus, a deep sleep of death, something from his side, the church formed. Both of them talk about bone and flesh. Bone and flesh. And then Paul is now saying in Ephesians chapter 5 that this is a great mystery. But he speaks concerning Christ and the church. In verse 31, he says, for this cause... He was linking the old. For this cause, verse 31, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. I want us to see that Ephesians 5, 30, 31, 32 is linked to a husband and a wife and is linked to the church and is also linked to Adam and Eve. Brethren, this thing is deeper 
than we dare to think. Understand that Moses himself, recall that he spoke to the rock. The, the children were going through, of Israel, were going through. They wanted water, and Moses spoke to the rock. That was the instruction he would have had. And he did just that. But later on, the same children of Israel continued to murmur when they needed water again. And in his frustration, Moses took his rod and smote the rock. Yes, the water came. But there was a problem. Because that action to smite the rock literally marred what that scenario was typified to mean. It had a significant meaning in the future. Because that rock was Christ. And Moses was not supposed to smite Christ. He was supposed to speak to the Christ. And the, the blessings would have been issued, would have flowed freely out. Because of what Moses did, he literally marred what was prefigured. He marred God's figure that had a meaning in the future. And we have to be very careful because Moses, because of that action, it wasn't just the smiting of the rock, but what that did, it marred what God prefigured and was supposed to happen in the future when Christ was here. And this is the same way he said to the same Moses, make sure that what I give you in this mountain, as it relates to the tabernacle, you build and execute accordingly. Because if he dared to change and to do otherwise, he would mar what it was typified to mean. And we have to be careful that we don't mar God's figure. Moses was unable to make it into the promise because of that action. You and I being in relationship in a physical sense, a man and a woman, it has its reflection in the church itself. It has meaning where the church is concerned. And, and the Apostle Paul makes it clear to us that he speaks, when it comes to the marriage relationship, he speaks about it in terms relating to the church. I want us to Christ is the head of the church. He keeps linking the relationship with husband and wife to Christ and the church. So we need to be careful that we ourselves don't mar the figure. Because we might be putting ourselves in grave danger. Because Moses did that and marred God's figure of what the speaking to the rock mean. And he smote the rock when Christ was not supposed to have been smitten, so that the, what was to have reality and what the prefiguring of that reality was, was no different. We can't do that where God's business is concerned. And Moses did not enter the promised land because of that. I want us to see and to take our relationship to the place where we can understand its spiritual meaning and the spiritual influence if we take the thing out of line. There are a lot to say. I have to stop now. The time has passed. But I want us to tune in because as it relates to the spiritual part of our togetherness, of our relationship, it is extremely important that we see where it all fits in. 
Being together is not simply a physical interaction. Even if it happened then, it is much more than that. It is deeper than that. And when we meet again, we will look at some more as it relates to our relationship and the deep spiritual meaning that it has. And I trust that it will help to put perspective to what we are engaged in so that we can then do our best to take the necessary steps to ensure that our relationships become what they are to be. If it is bad, can it be fixed? Yes. If it is not aligned with the spiritual meaning, can it be addressed? Yes. Can we be in danger if we take this thing of relationship lightly? Yes. And we have started to see already, I hope, that there are serious implications for how we deal with, how we treat with the relationships that you and I are in. When we meet next week, God's willing, we are going to look at the covenant part and we are going to see that what you and I are in as it relates to our relationship now, man and woman, marriage, is not merely us saying, I do. A threefold cord cannot be broken. And we will see from the book of Malachi that it was three of us that were there in that ceremony when we made the vow. And we are going to understand what covenants are. And we are going to look at about seven covenants in the Bible. And we are going to see the implications. And then us now making a covenant to see what the Bible says about that and we are going to then put them together as we conclude the sections on the spiritual implications of what relationship is and then we take it from there but we stop for this evening God's willing next week and then we go some what further and we continue on from there brothers and sisters ladies and gentlemen God bless you and if it is his will next week same time father in the name of our lord jesus we come before your great and your awesome presence we thank you for this privilege we thank you for this opportunity we thank you lord that we're able to look at and address and deal with this simple matter yet profound matter the matter of relationships uh look from the bible a biblical view i pray father in heaven that you will impress these simple thoughts upon all of our hearts and minds i pray father in heaven that you will open our eyes open our understandings allow for us to see how serious this whole matter is how serious you have taken it how serious the work that you did when you caused adam to go into a deep sleep and from his side you took the instrument that produced his bride. You showed us again in the New Testament that Jesus went into that deep sleep of death and from his side the blood and water came and that instrument was used to form the bride that you handed over. Lord Jesus, it is akin to our togetherness, our marriage, our relationship. I pray that you will help us to see the significance. I pray that you will help us to see the importance. I pray for the marriages. I pray for the relationships. I pray for those between parents and the children, those between brothers and sisters, all relationships, mighty God. I place them into your hands right now and ask that you will help us to do our best and do our part to make it right and to live the kind of life it will be done
Praise God. God bless you. Again, we say thank you for joining. And God's willing, uh, next week we pick up and continue on the subject, relationship, a biblical view. God bless you in Jesus' name. Sisters, to make reference to what has happened since we last met in church on Sunday. If you would realize all by now that the government of the land has imposed another set of measures to assist in curtailing the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And as a result, although for the last couple of months we have been enjoying coming into the house, even though it is by groups, but we were there, what has now happened is that the situation has reverted to what it was some months ago where only 10 persons are allowed to come into the assembly. And that being the case, we are going to go back to the template that we had where all the saints save the 10 uh, that will come out and that 10 will have in it, the preacher, the, the praise team, the media team, uh, the musicians, just the bare minimum so that we can have the service. But as was in the template the last time, we, were, we streamed right across and everyone stayed at home, participated, and indeed, under the circumstance, it was a great blessing. We are back at that point. Uh, while we are disappointed, we just have to understand that this is what it is. And in all things, I encourage the saints of the Most High God, in everything, give thanks. And so we are going to still lift him up, still glorify him, still thank him. Because at the end of the day, amen, we are a part of the church. And whatever comes, we have to face it, receive it, deal with it, and in all of that, still give glory to the great God that we serve. So just to let you know, just to remind us, and for those who didn't know, to let you know that comes this Sunday, we will not be in the tent. What will happen, however, is that Sunday school, as it has normally been, will continue. And Sunday school continues at 8 a.m. So we will not be changing the time. Uh, we have got acclimatized to it being 8 o'clock uh, until 9. And we wouldn't want to shift that, only to shift it again afterwards. So it was agreed that we will continue with Sunday school at 8 a.m. on Sunday morning. As a result of that, we would not even though it is going to be just one service, no, we would not bother to remove it from 9 o'clock, which is the time that we would have normally had our first service, and then put it to 10.30. You know, Sunday school being 8 to 9 still, we will keep it as is. And then the one service that we will have, we will have it at 9 a.m. Uh, to about 10.30 thereabout. So we want to use this medium to ask all our saints to remember Sunday school begins 8 a.m., the same time that it has been for the last few months, and we continue with that. And then we will have not two, <coughs> I'm sorry, not two, but one service, and that service begins at 9 a.m., all right? So we ask all our saints, as many of us, in fact, I shouldn't even say that, we ask all our saints, church begins at 9. So we are going to make the adjustments so that we are in church at the time that church is keeping. We can always go back to look at different sections afterwards, but oh, it would be great if the body gets together and we are all in church via the platform at 9 o'clock. And 
we really, really would appreciate that. Also, I wanted to use the opportunity. Uh, we, we did bless a few of our saints on Sunday because I just knew that folks were having uh, some difficulties. And there are more. And just at the time when we wanted to assist because of what we know was happening, the thing has gotten even worse. And so the very thing that we were trying to assist with starting Sunday Pass, the situation has become now more dire. And it is now happening at a time when there is no service so that we can even take an offering to assist some of these folks. And more folks are going to be affected. So just as we had done uh, months ago when we were under this template, where only 10 people were there, we came up with the novel. It was suggested and we followed through with it. We came up with the novel idea that we could have a drive-by and you do drop your tithes and your offering. The ushers will be here. They will not be in church, but a few, and we will have that worked out, very few, but they will be on the outside so that even though you pass to drop your offering off, you will not be allowed to come in the tent because we want to be conforming to the established protocol. But we do encourage us to drive by, drop off your tithes and offering, and if you're going to do something in terms of assisting those that are being severely impacted by the COVID-19 in terms of their livelihood, then you can still make a note that this is particularly for that. And of course, we will know how to do it and what to do to get it to them. So indeed, you can drive by, walk by, swing by, fly by. But however, you will not be able to stay in the service. And we, we really regret that, but it is what it is. And so the Lord bless you, and thank you for your understanding, and thank you for just being you. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Now, we're